Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are looking at the robot versus the Aztec mummy. So uh, this is actually the third film in a, uh, a trilogy of mummy movies, the Aztec mummy being the first, the curse of the Aztec mummy being the second, and, <laughs> well, unsurprisingly, I suppose, uh, this one, the robot versus the Aztec mummy being the third. Not only were these films all shot back to back, but they were also released within just a few months of each other. The first two were actually released in 1957, and this one was released in 1958. And actually, this particular film was also the focus of uh, one episode of Mystery Science Theatre. Anyway, in terms of the uh, format, it's going to be the same as usual. We shall start by using the film as a, uh, a jumping off point to look at um, Mesoamerican history in this case, and then I shall simply review the film and rate it out of 10. But before then, as usual, it is time for our dramatic intro. Right. You are an evil scientist gangster, who many believed dead. Five years ago, you stole an ancient artifact from an Aztec mummy, as it was believed that this had hieroglyphs on it that could lead to Aztec treasure. You wanted to find this treasure to fund your evil research. To your horror, you found out that the mummy was cursed to protect this artifact for all time. He burst through your door and ended up throwing you into a snake pit. Fortunately, you escaped through a secret passage, and now not only do you want the Aztec treasure, but you also want revenge on the mummy. Therefore, despite seemingly having no money, you managed to get hold of a load of lead, a human brain, a heap of uranium, and a full-on secret lab. With all of this acquired, you get to work on your masterpiece, a monster, part man, part machine. With this presumably costly creation, which, to be honest with you, would probably sell for more than the actual Aztec treasure, you once again head back to the crypt where the mummy now rests. Soon, the final showdown shall begin. The battle between the robot versus the Aztec mummy. Okay, so we've now arrived at the history section. As usual with these uh, Aztec episodes, uh, just a little disclaimer. I am an Egyptologist, not a Mesoamericanologist, though in fairness I have done my research and I shall try to remain as accurate as possible. With that out of the way, let us move on to the uh, the sort of like main subject. I will admit uh, this section is going to have um, very tenuous links to the film, but well, given that the film is literally about an Aztec mummy hanging around in a cemetery until like, you know, a robot comes along to fight it, I do kind of feel I can be forgiven. Um, in one of the flashback scenes to the first film in the trilogy, we see the mummy getting hurt by a Christian cross, you know, kind of like being held up to it. I've often quipped that these films get, uh, you know, like getting confused between vampires and mummies. To be honest, I still feel that is largely the case, but it is also worth noting that the Aztec Empire was actually largely brought down by uh, Spanish conquistadors who were Catholic. Therefore, to admittedly give this film um, far more credit than it deserves, it could be that this was symbolic of the Spanish conquest of the, uh, the Aztec Empire. So, in this section, we shall go over the, uh, the actual invasion itself, and in doing so, examine just how accurate the contemporary sources and you know are on the invasion. Our story starts with a man named Hernan Cortez. He was born in Medellin, Western Spain, to a family of the lower nobility. As such, although he was not necessarily uh, from the richest family in the land, he was well off, and well, this allowed him to study law at university. But quickly, he realised that this was not for him and he left to pursue adventure and riches in the, uh, in the Americas. In 1504, 
he arrived at Santo Domingo, uh, now the uh, Dominican Republic. And then in 1511, he headed to Cuba, where he helped a man named uh, Diego Velazquez to conquer the island. This assistance gave him a reputation for courage and daring. Velazquez went on to uh, become the governor of Cuba, and Cortes remained um, in Cuba for several years. During this time, Velazquez and Cortes do seem to have remained on good terms, but there was an underlining sort of like suspicion between them. In 1518, Cortes convinced Velazquez to allow him to take an expedition to Mexico. This was a land that was actually relatively newly discovered by uh, Europeans and was rumoured to hold many riches. Although Velazquez agreed to make Cortes the, uh, the commander for the expedition, he was growing ever more suspicious. And then, shortly before the, uh, the expedition set off, he changed his mind and cancelled it. Cortes promptly ignored him and set off anyway. <laughs> Um, when they arrived in Mexico, the first indigenous group they met were the uh, Totonacs. According to Diaz, a foot soldier of uh, Cortes who wrote a history of the events many years later in the, uh, the 1560s, the uh, Totonacs were friendly to the Spanish as they were fed up with Aztec rule and the sort of like high tribute demands that they were making of them. As such, they volunteered 1,000 300 warriors to the Spanish, and further even led them to other tribes who would be friendly to them. This was all going well until they arrived in the uh, territory of the Tlaxcalans. Once again, according to Diaz, this group attacked the uh, conquistadors with a force of 30,000 warriors. However, this number of warriors does seem a little bit high to me. You do have to ask yourself as well, how would Diaz have known this? I mean, don't get me wrong, he is a contemporary source, and he was actually there, but not only was he writing 40 years later, and well, well into his 80s, but numbers that high are very hard to estimate. Further, it needs to be realised that he was writing from the perspective of a, uh, a foot soldier. He was both trying to glorify the invasion, and emphasise the odds they were up against. Therefore, it is likely that these numbers were exaggerated. There were three battles between the Spanish and the Tlaxcalans, and in these, the Spanish took prisoners. They then released these prisoners back to the uh, Tlaxcalans with messages of peace. When the Tlaxcalans realised that the Spanish were willing to side with them against the, uh, the Aztec Empire, they agreed to ally with them and added another thousand warriors to Cortes's army. Next, the conquistadors arrived at the second largest city in the Aztec alliance, uh, Tulula. They entered this and then, heroically, eh, they attacked and massacred thousands of unarmed nobles within the city. It is likely that this was done to instill fear. However, Cortes himself claimed that uh, this was because he feared native treachery. I do kind of feel, however, if you have entered someone else's land and massacred a city, treachery is not really the right word here. You can't exactly betray someone when they are not on your side to begin with. Further, it is actually quite noticeable that, um, well, if, if the Aztecs had performed this kind of act, they would have absolutely been accused of uh, being barbaric. Why is it any different if the Spanish do it? Nevertheless, after this, Cortes and his men arrived at Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire. Here, surprisingly, they were actually welcomed peacefully by the Aztec Empire, uh, Moctezuma II. Now, this may, this may sound strange, and there's actually no complete consensus as to why he uh, sort of met them in this way. Um, one argument is that the Spanish arrival coincided with uh, religious prophetic beliefs. The idea here is that they associated the Spanish with one of their gods, uh, Quetzalcoatl. This theory, however, has fallen out of uh, favour in recent times, and is believed to have been a Spanish creation. As well, ultimately, it was both Cortes himself and Diaz who made this claim, uh, you know, in the first place. The second option is political strategy. 
At this point, Moxtezuma would have still been um, uncertain of the Conquistadors' um, intentions and what exactly they were after. In this way, not only could he question them, but he could also see their forces close up. Maybe they were even trying to win over the Spanish as allies. After all, at this point, the, uh, the Aztec Empire was at its height. But with these new borders came a uh, sort of like greater internal pressures. Ultimately, the issue here is that most of the sources we have actually come from the Spanish side. And so it can be difficult to uh, sort of see the motives of uh, the Aztec Empire. However, whatever the reason, the Spanish did indeed seem to enter Tenochtitlan peacefully. And as they entered, their eyes were met by a city of great magnificence. In their own words, they saw an enchanted vision, rising out of the lake and being four times bigger than any city in Europe. Not only was there impressive architecture, but unlike the Spanish cities, the streets were clean and tidy. However, by the same token, for all of the beauty they perceived, they also saw many sights that disturbed them, such as priests wandering through the streets, caked in blood. This was both their own and their sacrificial victims. Then, just six days after they entered the city, another quite perplexing event happened. Cortez and his men took Moctezuma, the Aztec Emperor, prisoner. Many Spanish sources claim that this capture was due to an attack on the uh, Totonac allies, you know, the, of the Spanish. This supposedly was in response to a Totonac rebellion that had happened earlier that year. And well, during the process of this uh, retaliation, many Totonacs and even some Spanish were killed. However, um, other Spanish sources have stated that this was merely an excuse uh, that Cortes needed to capture uh, Moctezuma. You know, he was always planning to capture him to begin with. Either way, after this, Cortes wrote back to uh, Charles V, the uh, King of Spain, and well, as well as giving him a detailed description of the expedition so far, of course carefully worded to make himself look absolutely awesome, he also boasted that he would uh, keep Moctezuma alive in chains, or make him subject to your majesty's royal crown. Cortes then attempted to rule uh, Tenochtitlan through Moctezuma, and well, surprisingly, did so relatively successfully for about six months. However, during this time, resentment towards the Spanish was growing ever more in the city. Shocking considering they'd literally imprisoned the Emperor. How absolutely unreasonable of the Aztecs. <laughs> However, to continue this story, we need to head back to, uh, to Cuba. Back to the governor, Velazquez, the, uh, the very man who Cortes had disobeyed to go to Mexico in the first place. Velazquez had just sent a new expedition to Mexico, and the goal of this expedition was to take Cortes prisoner for, for going against his orders. When they arrived, Cortes went to fight them, likely with the help of many indigenous allies. And in fact, not only did he win, he also incorporated many of the defeated soldiers into his own forces. However, this is not the main part of the story. In the meantime, he placed another conquistador, uh, Pedro de Alvado, as governor over the city. According to several sources, including Diaz, and a source named the Florentine Codex, whose writer actually interviewed many native allies as well as Spanish soldiers, Moctezuma had asked Alvado whether the Aztecs could celebrate a festival known as, known as the, uh, the Feast of Toxtacle. Alvado had agreed, but as the feast went on, Alvado ordered his forces to rush into the temple, slaughtering the unarmed nobles inside. Interestingly, we actually have Aztec accounts, um, you know, for this event, largely thanks to the Florentine Codex. They claim that Alvado did this because he was enticed by the, uh, the gold and riches that they were wearing. However, much like with Spanish sources, we do have to treat this with some level of scepticism. But we also need to realise that the Aztecs 
we're not going to entirely know the uh, the Spanish motivations. On the other hand, in fairness, the, some even some Spanish sources do sometimes agree with the Aztec words here, though they also state that tensions were beginning to grow before this point, and that many of the uh, the citizens did not want the Spanish there. As such, this may have been a case of um, Alvado acting preemptively, attacking first before he was attacked. Regardless, this meant that when uh, Cortes returned to the city, it was at breaking point. As such, he tried to get Moctezuma to appease the angry crowds. According, once again, to uh, Diaz, uh, Cortes um, forced Moctezuma to appear on the balcony of his palace and to appeal for peace. The crowds began to throw stones, darts and arrows. Several of these hit Moctezuma, one hit being fatal. However, in Book 12 of the Florentine Codex, it also states that it was actually the Spanish to throw Moctezuma over the balcony, and in yet more accounts, the Aztecs found him strangled to death. So we don't actually know who killed him. Regardless, this led to further escalation in the violence, and, well, the Aztecs became even more hostile towards the Spanish. This attack led to the Spanish being forced out of Tenochtitlan, gaining many casualties as they did. This event would later be dubbed Le Noche Triste, or in English, The Sad Night. Battered, bruised and defeated, the Spanish fell back to the, uh, the territory of the uh, Tlaxcalans to regain their health and morale. The Tlaxcalan king gave the Spanish refuge and promised further assistance in the conquest of uh, Tenochtitlan, but only under certain conditions. As well as uh, being exempt from any sort of tribute, he wanted part of the spoils of war and control of two provinces that bordered his land. Cortes had no choice but to agree. Then, in May 1521, Cortes returned to Tenochtitlan and surrounded the city. This time, he was determined to capture it. And to do so, he needed a new strategy. Cortes set up blockades at each of the causeways leading into the city, meaning that food could not get in. Slowly, he gained access as famine spread through the streets. As they entered the city, according to Diaz, the inhabitants looked so thin, sallow, dirty and stinking that it was painful to see them. The Aztecs were so hungry that after seven-eighths of the city was taken, they began to gnaw on tree barks. Yet did the Spanish stop their attack? No, they continued into the city, causing death wherever they went. Later, when writing about this uh, to King Charles V, Cortes even, in many ways, pinned himself as a victim. He claimed that he gave the Aztecs so many opportunities for peace, but paints them as barbarians who refused to surrender, determined to die. As such, they forced Cortes and his men to commit unspeakable acts. He complains that he wanted to save the city, but the Aztecs forced him to destroy it. Poor, poor Cortes. He is definitely the one we should be feeling sorry for here. Then, in August 13th, 1521, Tenochtitlan finally was captured by Cortes. In fairness, this was not the end of the Aztec Empire, but it was undeniably a big blow to them and could be seen as the beginning of the end. So, at the beginning of this section, I posed a question. How accurate are the contemporary sources? In fairness, there are some positives here. There is no denying that, well, as contemporary sources, they are absolutely invaluable eyewitness accounts that can't be taken away from them. During the course of this invasion, Cortes wrote five detailed letters back to King Charles V, and in three of these, he gives detailed outlines of the invasion. All of the major events here are backed up by both Diaz and the Florentine Codex. Further, when it comes to the Florentine Codex, the writer even interviewed natives, allowing for a different perspective. However, on the downside, even when it does come to the Florentine Codex, 
Much like the, uh, the letters of Cortes and the work of Diaz, it was written with a pro-Spanish bias. Further, the natives that the, uh, the writer of the Florentine Codex was interviewing were mostly the allies of Spain, so even here there is a high level of bias. When it comes to Diaz, although he gives a unique perspective on the conquest from, you know, the point of view of a foot soldier, once again it's worth noting that not only does he have uh, a strong Spanish bias and the goal of glorifying the invasion and essentially his part in it, he was also writing 40 years after the actual conquest and when he was well into his 80s. Finally, when it comes to uh, Cortes, it needs to be realised that he basically had everything resting on this invasion. He had gone against the orders of the governor of Cuba, which in turn meant that in Spanish law he should have been arrested. Therefore, the letters he wrote back to King Charles V were very much designed to big himself up and justify his own actions. Further, it is undeniable that even when he was committing mass murder and causing terrible famines, he paints himself as the victim. Therefore, although these sources are undeniably invaluable, it needs to be realised that not only were they written uh, mostly from a Spanish perspective, but they also hold their own individual biases. Right, so, on to the review. Believe it or not, there are actually some genuine positives here. For instance, I do actually feel that out of the three films, this one has the best overall atmosphere. The first film in the series was far too dark, like I literally couldn't see what was happening. The second film was fun, but I mean, hardly atmospheric at all. I mean, it literally had a luchador superhero running around. This one, however, does seem to try in this regards, albeit admittedly in a, a very kind of like trope heavy way. So, um, for instance, now that the mummy's tomb has been destroyed, uh, the mummy has to find a new place to rest, you know, to kind of like protect the, uh, the breastplate and, uh, and bracelet. As such, he goes to a very kind of like old and creepy graveyard and finds a crypt. Or for instance, whenever you see the bat in his secret laboratory, there is always a big window behind him as rain plummets down and thunder rumbles. Admittedly for him then to, uh, you know, <laughs> walk outside and, and the weather be absolutely perfect. I guess they didn't want to mess up his makeup in there. <laughs> but still, basically put, uh, whether you see this as a uh, positive or a negative will very much rely on, on you know, how you view these things. Personally, I think that although these things are a little bit, you know, cliched, they do fall more into the realm of kind of like a trope, so uh, I quite like them. Next, in the, um, in the second film, one of the uh, minor characters, a, a mobster under the employ of the bat, gets pushed into a table by the mummy. As he hits it, a load of vials break uh, containing acid, burning his face. In this one, that same gangster is now permanently mutated, and as such, he's kind of like stuck by the uh, the bat's side, waiting his time to gain revenge on the mummy. I genuinely wasn't expecting there to be any kind of uh, story development at all when it came to minor characters. So I'm going to give the film kudos for that. That's something the film didn't have to do, but it, it did. It was a little bit of extra detail, and that's great. However, realistically, um, this is where the purely good elements of the film end. Fortunately though, and, and I suppose um, highly unsurprisingly given the, um, the other films in the series, and admittedly the fact that this film is literally called the, uh, the Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy, there are plenty of unintentionally charming parts to this film that, I will admit, they, they legitimately made me laugh. So, to give an example, I love that once again, this film starts by claiming that the entire trilogy is based on a true story. No one is going to believe that in the slightest. I mean, like, right, we literally have hypnosis into past lives, luchador superheroes, a mad scientist who can mismatch animals to make terrifying creations, a living mummy who's protecting ancient artifact, and a uranium-fueled 
robot with a human brain. So when you have a very serious man going, this is based on the sincere accounts of those who witnessed it, it's just a little bit hard not to snigger. <laughs> Further to that, and well, I guess, um, again, unsurprisingly, uh, the acting and script here are just the, you know, just the right level of bad to make it kind of like sweet without being annoying. For instance, when the good guys find the graveyard. Bear in mind they had spent the entire night searching for this alone, and that came after a lengthy investigation. One of the characters just goes, Now comes the hard part. We have to look around until we find the mummy. The wording of that alone is funny enough, but the fact that then they just immediately find the crypt is just, just perfect. Like, they literally go, Oh, now we're in for a really long search. Oh, how on earth are we going to find this crypt? Oh, look, there it is. And look, when it comes to this graveyard in general, everything that happens there is just pure gold. So, right, for a start. Uh, for some reason, in this film, the bat can now hypnotise the heroine, Floor, from a great distance. I'm not sure why he's able to do this, and <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't think the writers knew either. But basically, he gets her to awaken from her sleep to lead them to the graveyard. And, you know, he does this so that he can find the mummy again. As a result of this, she gets mud on her slippers. Dr. Eduardo, the, uh, the main character who's, you know, like also her husband, from this alone goes, Ah, mud on your slippers. The bat must have hypnotised you from a great distance and gotten him to show you the location of the mummy. Then lately, shortly after this scene, Eduardo and his assistant, they steal one of her slippers and take it to a lab to be analysed, you know, to uh, get the, uh, the dirt analysed. In this way, they find out where the mummy is, because basically there's, like, limestone in the, uh, in the sample. And I mean, look, I'm sorry, but there's just one or two, two you know, just small leaps of logic here. <laughs> um, on top of this, um, at this point, Eduardo is supposed to be telling a story of something that happened, um, you know, about five years ago. So, let, let's just put that into context. Both he and the bat found the mummy. Then the bat decided the best thing that he could possibly do in this moment is to go off and spend a small fortune getting uranium, a human brain, a heap of lead like iron and wiring, so that he can build a robot to fight the mummy. Meanwhile, supposedly, Eduardo is just, you know, kind of like sitting there waiting and, and doing nothing. And, and the thing is, Eduardo keeps talking about how the police will not believe him. He's literally had five years to show them where the mummy is. Like, the mummy isn't going any, anywhere. He could have just led them to the cemetery. <laughs> It feels like no one in this film is pressed for time in the slightest. But also, right, okay. Like, like I just said, the bat is still after the Aztec treasure. He wants this so he can fund his research. But somehow, he's able to build a super robot that can shoot uranium and is part human. At some point, you do have to kind of think, surely this invention, this marvel of science, Maybe, you know, maybe actually worth more than the Aztec treasure. And then we come to the, you know, the actual mummy itself. Okay, right, let, let's set the scene. We have the bat, clad in a lab coat, laughing evilly at his plan as thunder rumbles in the background. Very dramatic. It is then made known that the robot has been awoken by a huge vault of electricity. As such, the bat wanders around his lab, getting things ready for his Frankenstein-esque plan. The camera slowly pans around to an altar, where the boxiest, goofiest, cutest looking robot lies. I mean, this robot is straight out of the cheapest episode of Doctor Who. It is clearly just, you know, made of cardboard and bits of old tube with the odd bit of like steam coming out of it for effect. Honestly, I saw this robot, a huge smile spread over my face, and I audibly went, Aww! It was literally everything I had dreamed it would be, and so much more. 
And then we get to the actual fight between the, uh, the mummy and the robot. So, okay, right. They take the artifact from the mummy. I mean, basically, the, uh, the bat goes in with the robot. He takes the artifact. Then the mummy slowly sits up. The robot waits politely until he's upright. And then the mummy and the robot just slowly walk towards each other and kind of like hug fight, I suppose. Like they literally just hug and then one occasionally pushes the other away in a very gentle kind of fashion. <laughs> it is honestly the most hilariously underwhelming fight scene I have ever seen. And I absolutely love it. Like it's just so badly done. <laughs> However, as is sadly the case with such a high class masterpiece such as this there are also a few negatives um the biggest one happens right at the beginning of the film bearing in mind that the runtime for this is only a smidge over an hour long 25 minutes of that are purely flashback scenes to the previous two films and you know this has clearly been done in a way to uh, just sort of like flesh out the runtime like they show several lengthy scenes from the uh, the first two films which could have like easily been condensed significantly and what's most annoying about this is um that the film legitimately left me wanting more so for instance the robot and the mummy only meet once in what is you know probably the most underwhelming fight scene that's ever been created and okay don't get me wrong i did i did say that that was a fun scene earlier on but ultimately, it still felt like the film missed an opportunity here. Like, you know, there could have been sort of like maybe a rubber match situation going on where there was a few more rounds. So maybe it could have been that when they take the artifacts from the mummy in the crypt, the robot takes the mummy by surprise and wins the first round. In this one, maybe the, the you know, the mummy could only just escape in dramatic fashion or maybe not dramatic. Maybe I'm asking too much of the film there. Um, then, later on, the mummy comes after the artifacts again, and this time manages to defeat the robot. But, you know, he only does so because the good guys manage to wrestle the control out of the bat's hand. Then maybe, I, I don't know, like, the robot could be hit by lightning or something. I, I don't think it really matters how it happens in a film like this. Uh, but basically, the, the robot could gain free will, which leads to the final round in which the mummy could win. This film, again, it was only an hour long, 25 minutes of that was pure flashback, and it just feels like they could have used that time more effectively. So, in conclusion, well, what is there to say about this film, really? On the plus side, the film has a better atmosphere than its two predecessors, and I like that they even built up one of the minor characters, you know, with the mobster who got his face burnt. There are also heaps of, uh, you know, parts of this film that are, you know, charmingly bad. The acting and script are, you know, kind of sweet but not annoying. Dr. Eduardo finds out uh, where the mummy is and then doesn't bother to do anything about it for five years, which I'm sorry, is just fantastic. And the robot is the silliest, most charming invention that's ever been made in, in any film ever. However, on the downside, there were a ludicrous number of flashback scenes here, which almost made up half the film. And as I was left wanting more, it, it does feel like they could have used this time more effectively. Overall, once again, there is no doubt that this film falls into the, uh, you know, so bad it's good category, meaning that the highest it can really achieve based on this podcast's criteria is a 6 out of 10. Anything higher than that is really well reserved for films that are good for the reason they were made. Unfortunately, uh, the ridiculous amount of flashback scenes here does mean that I can't give this film a full 6 out of 10. Like, it means it's, it's got to be knocked down a little bit. However, I am going to give this film a strong 5.5 .5 out of 10. If you would like to see this film for yourself, I have put a link to it in the description for the episode below.